I know we're at quite different times in the day. So um, my welcome slide is just a picture of the ISIS uh, facility. So uh, Professor Evi uh, has probably uh, been to this building here in the past, uh, and that's that's where I do most of my work too. So um, I'm going to talk about advanced battery technology as seen from the bottom up, looking from the perspective of what's going on at the scale of the atoms and how that impacts on the larger scale of battery cells and then up to the applications in particularly in battery electric vehicles. So um, what I'll talk about, I'll, I'll briefly introduce myself, although after that kind introduction, I don't have very much more to say. And then I'm going to talk about some of the challenges of battery research. And I think to see the work we do on batteries, um, batteries are a complicated problem and we need to see how our own work fits into that specific, uh, into that, that context. Then I'll introduce how muon spectroscopy works and I'll give some examples of how muon measurements have been applied to some key challenges in battery research. And then I'll conclude at the end. Okay, so I think um, what I have here has already been said. Um, but uh, this is me standing next to one of ISIS's muon spectrometers. This is the one we use for most of the experiments on battery materials. Um, and that's where I've done most of the experiments for the Faraday Institution's FutureCat project. Now, the ISIS neutron muon and muon source um, has a particle accelerator, uh, and then that accelerates protons up to about 85% of the speed of light. And then they're collided with stationary targets um, one target that produces muons, uh, which we have seven experimental areas uh, coming ar around that target, and then two targets that produce neutrons for a variety of different neutron measurements. I'm not going to talk about the neutron measurements today. I'm going to focus on just the muon measurements. So how does ISIS work? Well, this is a sort of map of ISIS, and we start with a source of ions, and those are hydrogen minus ions. Um, they're the easiest to uh, accelerate at low energies. And the ion source looks like this. And at the very start is a bottle of hydrogen gas, slightly doped with cesium, and that allows you to make hydride ions more easily. That injects into a linear accelerator in two parts. Um, that's the, what the first part looks like. Uh, and this is the second part. And you can see the size of the accelerator compared to those steps. So we're already at quite a large scale here. And then after the um, hydrogen minus ions have got to about a quarter of the speed of light, the electrons are stripped off in a thin graphene foil, and then they're injected into a proton synchrotron, which accelerates them up to, to full speed, which is about 85% of the speed of light. That's again, quite large. Um, this is one of the junctions in, in the accelerator where the beam goes off towards one of the targets. And you can see the people working here during a maintenance period, so the accelerator's off, so they're, they're quite safe. Um, but the accelerator is that large compared to people. That, that's what I wanted to convey in that slide. And then once the uh, protons come out, they go to the target stations, and then we can do experiments. Um, ISIS uses neutrons and muons to look at where atoms are in materials and what those atoms are doing. And for muon studies of battery materials, it's really about what the atoms are doing. Now, the other part of my uh, role is a co-investigator on the Faraday Institution's FutureCat project. Um, the idea of the Faraday Institution was that the British government recognised that Britain has for a long time had a large automotive industry. And as well as making cars, the British automotive industry also made even more engines for cars. And if in the future cars don't have engines, then that part of the British automotive industry won't exist anymore. So it should be replaced by uh, a battery industry. And so they set in motion uh, a relatively large um, project. The whole project is about a quarter of a billion dollars, um, but the research part is, is maybe a third of that. And looking at all these different aspects of battery technology, some of which are already applied to batteries that are in use uh, or, or will come to the end of their life, and going forward to very advanced battery technologies like lithium sulfur and solid state batteries. And of course, those are less mature, less technologically ready. Now, the project I'm part of is focused on cathode materials, and that's the highest value part of a battery cell. Um, and it's perhaps also one of the areas that might need the most improvement because improvements in other areas seem to be developing well. Um, 
So our project is looking at different approaches to improving energy density, power density, uh, cost, and, and the lifetime of the cells. And I'll come back to some of those aspects later in the talk. So I want to make some general comments about the challenges involved with battery research, because I think seeing any particular work in its context is very important. So the first comment I have is that batteries have to be good at everything. And there's a lot of ways you can measure the performance of a battery, uh, the cost, how much energy you can store inside it, how long it's going to uh, work for and how safe it is. And in every application, all of those different performance metrics matter. But in any given application, you can normally prioritize those requirements. So what's most important, what's least important, and then you can choose your battery chemistries, the way you develop those into cells and packs, according to those re prioritized requirements. So if we think about stationary storage, so if you want to store energy on the electrical grid, that has a completely different set of requirements or priorities to if you were trying to make an electric aeroplane. And for a battery electric vehicle, the requirements are somewhere between those two limits. The, the second, um, so here's, here's an example of some performance goals for electric vehicle batteries. And these are the ones from the Faraday Institution's project at the start. Um, other national governments, other industry um, bodies have set out similar lists and, and the numbers they have on are similar. So it's talking about bringing down the price of cells by about a factor of two, roughly doubling the energy density, even larger increases in power density, and then a variety of other factors that will make electric vehicle batteries both more effective and more sustainable. And those are both very important things as we try to electrify more parts of uh, our ec economic activity. The second point is that batteries are really complicated and they're not quite as complicated as the fractal shown here, but we have lots of materials that are combined together to make a battery work. And those materials change as the battery operates. And the most complicated part in batteries is often the interfaces between these materials. So we've got all these multiple processes going on in a battery and they're on different scales of lengths and times. And if you're looking at any particular issue, you need to work out which processes are important before you can even start to study them effectively. The third thing is that you actually need an awful lot of different techniques to study batteries effectively. I mean, this is um, a figure from a fairly recent paper and it, it's really not a complete list. Um, but it shows how different techniques are specific to different length scales and different time scales. And often if you want a complete picture of even a single process inside a battery, you need to combine the results from multiple techniques and know what each of those techniques will tell you. So what sort of length and time scales are we thinking about? So if we just consider a battery material by itself, which is the simplest thing to study, if an individual ion moves, it'll move by about a nanometer, and it'll do that about a million times every second at room temperature. And the particle sizes, well, they can be tens of nanometers if you're thinking about agglomerations of very small particles into larger particles. But if you're thinking about the latest single crystal materials, those might be 10 micrometers in scale. And an ion's going to take seconds or minutes to move for through that sort of size particle. In a device, it's of course more complicated. Um, so I'll talk later about both um, materials that go in lithium ion batteries, but also materials that go in all solid state batteries. Um, the length scales are quite similar. Uh, we're talking about tens of microns for the electrolyte, um, also tens of microns for the anodes and cathodes. And then you might want to charge and discharge your cell in about 10 minutes if you're thinking about future electric vehicles, or maybe about 10 hours if you're thinking of a solar powered aeroplane that's flying at very high altitude and only needs to run one battery cycle per day. Then the areas can be quite large if you think about how much electrode area is wound up inside a single cylindrical cell. So 
thinking about length scales and time scales allows you to think about what sort of techniques you can use to study and characterize natural materials. Now, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on the results of one technique, and it's the technique that I use. But almost everybody in the battery community only understands how to use a small fraction of all the available techniques. So while you can learn more techniques, you can't necessarily learn them all. So you often have to use the li research literature for comparisons with the techniques you can use to build up a full picture. You can work with people who use other techniques and you can combine the technique that you know how to use and the other techniques you know how to use with other techniques and do that in the same experiment. And then you can learn multiple things about what's going on at the same time. And you need to think very hard about what questions the techniques you know can answer but also it's really important what tech, what questions they can't answer because that can allow you to focus on the questions where you can make useful contributions to what's known about materials and what can what problems can be solved so muon spectroscopy is the technique that i use um, for almost all my experiments and sometimes in com combination with other things and very often in terms of publishing results, the muon spectroscopy results will be combined with results from several other techniques. So firstly, I should say what muons are. So they're an elementary particle. They're most like the electron, but they're about 200 times heavier. And they're unstable particles, so they decay radioactively, and they have a lifetime of about two microseconds. But otherwise, their properties are quite similar to the electron. And the difference in mass causes a difference in magnetic moment, and so how the muon responds to magnetic fields. And it turns out that the size of that magnetic moment compared to the muon lifetime is quite convenient for measuring magnetic fields inside materials. In some chemical systems, the muon can behave like a lighter version of a proton. So the comparison there is quite important. And the proton's about nine times heavier than the muon. And so it has a smaller magnetic moment. Um, and of course, protons you can think of doing NMR experiments with. Um, indeed, that's what most NMR measurements use. And a lot of muon measurements are quite similar to NMR, but we, we have some differences that I'll come on to in a moment. So what do we use muons for? So we can have positively charged muons, so that's the antimatter particle. And they're easier to make because the things we make them from are also positively charged. Um, and they can be made fully spin polarized. So we can use them to measure magnetic fields inside things a little bit like NMR. So obviously magnets have magnetic fields inside them. So do superconductors. And those are the fields from the electrons in the material. In battery materials, which I'm gonna talk about today, it's the fields from the atomic nuclei around where the muon stops and how they change as the ions move. You can also look at chemical reactions. We can, can use negatively charged muons for similar experiments, and we can also use them to understand the elemental composition of things because the negative muons are captured by the, by the elements inside a material, and X-rays come out a little bit like X-ray fluorescence experiments. So that's a, another technique that has been applied to battery materials uh, using muons. So the neutron experiments that I assist and X-ray experiments, scattering techniques. So the, the particle goes into the sample, it scatters and comes out, and then you detect it and you see how much it scatters. With muons, the muons come along in a beam and then they stop in the sample. And when they've stopped, they probe only their local environment, perhaps around 10 nanometers around where they've stopped, but they're stopped in the bulk of the sample. So it's not just a surface sensitive technique. And because we can make the muons fully spin polarized, we can do the sort of experiments you do with NMR, but we don't have to use large magnets, and we can be sensitive to slightly different things. And the muons end up about a third of a millimeter inside the material, and we can probe frequencies from kilohertz to megahertz, and that happens to be the same sort of time scale that individual ion hops within a material occur on. So what sort of ions can you study with muons? Well, you have um, things with nuclear magnetic moments, so lithium and sodium, and if that nuclear magnetic moment is abundant, 
and large, the measure measurement's very easy. Um, you can also look at other materials which have um, lower abundances of their nuclear magnetic moment, um, but then you get a smaller signal. So does NMR work on to study this material? If yes, then you can probably do muon measurements as well. This is color coded as if they're traffic lights, so green for go, red for stop, and, and yellow for maybe proceed with caution. So what sort of information are we getting from muons in battery materials? So we're measuring how often ions, which have a nuclear magnetic moment, move past the stationary muon. And that's essentially the self-diffusion rate at the atomic level. And if you know which routes, which pathways, the ions are going to take through the material, you can then compare that with bulk diffusion. And almost all our measurements are done as a function of temperature. Um, and then you can look at how this diffusion rate changes, and that tells you about the energy barriers to the ionic motion. We also look at the field distributions inside the sample, and that's essentially how far the atoms are away from where the muon has stopped. So if the local structure changes, that field distribution will change too, and we can get some useful information from that as well. So looking at some of the key performance uh, parameters uh, I mentioned before, um, I'll give you some examples of how we've used muon measurements to address those. And I've done this work with a, a range of collaborators, um, principally the group of Serena Kaur, who's at the University of Sheffield in the UK. Uh, and this is some of her group and, and then us doing an experiment and someone who joined the group after that experiment was done. Um, also Tom Ashton at the University College London. And if time allows, I'll, I'll mention uh, an example from of magnesium diffusion studies. And that was work done with Jordi Cabana at the University of Chicago and Ryan Bayless. Um, this work has been funded by a number of uh, sources, particularly the Faraday Institution and one of the UK's um, science research councils, um, but then some other bodies from around the world. So the first performance um, goal I'm going to mention is cost, because that, that applies to almost every application. And at the moment, most battery electric vehicles use lithium NMC cathodes, which are just being talked about in the previous uh, set, uh, talk. And they're the most expensive part of battery. And the raw materials make up almost half of the total cost of the battery. So if you can find cheaper materials, um, you might be able to open up your battery technology to more markets. Um, different organizations and, and companies are, are moving to different materials. So Volkswagen's talking about increasing the manganese content to re remove cobalt, um, but more widely, particularly in China, there's a move towards studying lithium ion phosphate. So that was something, I, that was actually the, the way I started my work in, in battery materials was studying lithium ion phosphate and the lithium diffusion in it. Um, it has a fairly well-known layered structure and the ions move along channels along the B-axis of that structure. And our, I started studying this to look at the magnetism, but pretty much ever since I've been looking at the lithium diffusion. So one thing that was really notable when I started studying lithium ion phosphate was if you measured the diffusion rate and the activation energy for uh, lithium diffusion with different techniques here, you got enormously different answers. Almost always in science, if we measure a thing, different measurements will agree to better than one order of magnitude. Here, you can see that there's actually nine orders of magnitude in the different estimates of this diffusion rate. And the activation energies differ by a factor of five or, or six even. So there's a huge range of answers. So what happens if you do another experiment and you try and get a different view of what's going on? So we did our muon measurements and we did them as a function of temperature. And we can see as the temperature increases, so does the rate at which the, the lithium ion are moving through the material. This is, we refer to it as, as new, but it's, it's a hopping rate. And it's about half a megahertz at, at room temperature. And because we know the paths that the lithium ions take through the material, we can convert that into an approximate lithium diffusion rate. And you can see that's in reasonable agreement with the first principles calculations and some of the MERS power spectroscopy. Um, but it's much larger than the bulk measurement. 
and the activation energy is on the low end of these predictions, particularly um, so more similar to the first principles calculations than the bulk measurement. Now, what's going on here is that at the local scale of the atoms, lithium ions can move quite freely. But once you go on to the larger length scales, sort of um, many, many hops through the material or getting up towards the particle size, there are extra things that prevent the lithium ions moving. So the local techniques like muons and the theoretical calculations and the MERS power spectroscopy aren't affected by these longer length scales. So they suggest very fast lithium ion motion, but bulk measurements, which are affected by these mesoscopic barriers, they show much slower motion. And so that sent us towards looking at ways we could tune the way the material is made to avoid these barriers on the long length scales. So the next thing I'm gonna talk about is power density. And if you think all the way down to the scale of the atoms, how fast the ions can move is the fundamental limit on the power density of the material. Now in reality, things on much longer length scales are the limits, but we still want to promote the rapid ion mobility at the small length scales so that we can maximize what we can get from the materials. And because ions can move along different pathways, that can change how rapidly they move. Now, quite a long time ago, uh, this is, uh, we could even say in the last century, um, there was a computational prediction of two different diffusion pathways in lithium cobalt. Here. One uh, taking a relatively direct route between two sites and the other one um, taking an intermediate site. And they were predicted to have significantly different activation barriers for these two routes. Um, I would note here that these energy barriers are really, really large. And if that was true in reality, lithium cobalt tape wouldn't be a very good cathode material. We know that it is. So I hope that when, we, when I show you the, the smaller energy barriers we actually measured in, in our experiments, you won't be too surprised because we know that the answers shouldn't be this big because we know lithium cobaltate works. So we studied uh, lithium NCA instead. Um, that has some benefits as a material in terms of its energy and power densities and its lifetime, but it's uh, more expensive than NMC or LFP. But um, this is what often Tesla are using in their um, electric vehicle battery packs. So again, we measure the muon signal is a function of temperature. And here, instead of just having one steady increase, we see two separate increases um, at different gradients. If you look at that as a logarithm of the hopping rate and then the inverse temperature, you can start drawing some straight lines to pull out the energy barriers. And you can see that there's two regions with a gap in between. And the ratio between these energy barriers is almost identical to what was predicted, but the barriers themselves are quite a lot smaller. Now, another one of, well, another two of the performance goals that apply to almost every application significantly is safety and lifetime. And one route people have suggested to get safer batteries is to have all solid state cells. The idea being the liquid electrolyte causes a lot of failures in battery cells and, and can be quite unsafe when it fails because you can get fires. But it's not an easy route to take. Um, and we looked at a model system um, based on NASICON materials to overcome some of the challenges. But one thing that was notable in the lab experiments was if you discharge the battery cell below one and a quarter volts, it no longer was a rechargeable cell. You actually had to warm it up significantly and, and then it was the ion motion would be fast enough to allow recharging. And why was that happening? Was it something at the medium length scales of the cell or was it at the scale of the atoms themselves? So this is um, an experiment which was uh, we published earlier this year. Um, so we take two NASICON materials, one of which with titanium in the cathode material, uh, the one with zirconium in the solid electrolyte, and you have this cell stack. And because these materials have very similar structures, as the lithium is removed from the cathode, or put into the cathode for that matter, the structural changes aren't too large to cause them, the cell to fall apart. So turning this into a, a muon experiment, we have our beam of muons 
and we make sure we can stop them in the electrolyte. And that's the part we want to look at in the experiment. And this is inside a relatively standard coin cell, but with an inspection window. Um, we've moved on a little bit from this since the experiment was done, and we now have a larger version of this to give us a higher counting rate uh, and much better quality data. So does the ionic motion change as the battery cell is discharged? Well, yes, you go along above one and a quarter volts, it's higher, and then below one and a quarter volts, it's clearly taking a step down. And the distribution of magnetic fields in the sample also change at that point. So we're seeing that what, where we know there's a change on the scale of the cell, it also is based on uh, a change at the atomic scale, which we can measure with the muons. So I hope I have a little time uh, to continue. Um, but um, we think about the future of batteries where we try and electrify more aspects of our economic activity. We're going to have to use ions other than lithium, probably, because ion uh, lithium is relatively rare. Um, if you're able to use things like sodium and magnesium, which are much more abundant, you're going to have cheaper batteries, probably, and you might well be able to use them for different applications. Now, magnesium is interesting because. Um, it seems like you can use the metal anode um, in the battery directly. You don't have a problem with lithium dendrites to the same extent, but this is an unsolved problem. There are lots of pieces missing from getting a working magnesium ion battery. And one of the questions that's been around for a long time is, do the magnesium ions actually move fast enough in the cathode materials to allow the magnesium battery to work uh, effectively? So we did some experiments to look at that directly. Um, so the challenge with magnesium for, for us and for some other techniques is that the fraction of ions that have a nuclear magnetic moment is about 10%. So that reduces our signal size because we're looking for those nuclear magnetic moments with the muon. And the, the nuclear moment is also quite small. So those two things make it rather harder. Now, in principle, you could get a very high energy density from these cells because you could use a metal anode. Um, and that doesn't have dendrite formation. Magnesium is massively more abundant than lithium, so it's much cheaper. And because you can carry two units of electrical charge per ion, it's almost overcoming the extra mass that you have compared to a lithium with a single electrical unit of electrical charge. But people haven't reported many complete cell chemistries. It's assumed that magnesium moves quite slowly in the cathodes, and there aren't very many electrolytes either. So there's a lot left to do. So we looked at spinel materials, um, and you can have different structures of spinel materials. Some have a normal spinels. Sometimes you can swap which ions are on which sites and have partially inverted spinels. And that changes the way the ions diffuse through the material. And we looked at that with muons. But actually, um, my collaborators had first looked at it with NMR measurements and theory. And they've been able to identify with the theory the different pathways that magnesium would take in the two structures. And they measured the activation energies and, and calculated what the activation energies should be. But because there are paramagnetic ions in these materials, it complicates the NMR analysis. And NMR is also hard because this low nuclear abundance and small moments. So they wanted a, a way of checking the results they already had with a separate technique. And, they use, and we use muons to do that. Now, the signal size in muon experiments was smaller than it would be for something like lithium or sodium, but still much larger relatively than the NMR signal. And we were able to measure the same activation energies as were measured with NMR and, and calculated with the theory. So we have a really good consistency check here that different difficult measurements give the same answer. So they're probably giving a reliable answer. Now, this wasn't entirely successful. Um, so for our partially inverted materials, what we saw was the magnetism of the manganese because it was then on a site which the muon was more sensitive to. And probably we're also looking for something more difficult to see because of the higher energy barrier that was apparent from the calculations and the NMR measurements. 
So hopefully now is about the right time to conclude. So I, I draw conclusions of what I have said and what I haven't said, um, because I think both are quite important. So even if you're only using one technique or a small number of techniques, you can still tackle several important challenges in characterizing battery materials and cells. But you need to think about how what you're doing fits into the wider understanding of battery technologies, battery materials. And if you can combine techniques, that makes it much easier to get that understanding. Now, even in things I've talked about, there's lots of room for improvement. And I think one thing, if you are here and, and we're told that everything is a solved problem, you just have to build the factory and, and build lots and lots of batteries, um, what would you really be learning? But actually, even at the scale of the materials, uh, there's still a lot of progress to be made. So the way materials are coated to increase their lifetime, the way the compositions can be tuned to increase the performance and reduce the price, those, those are still very important issues. And we're working towards new cathode materials, new solid electrolyte materials, materials that use ions other than lithium, sodium batteries, magnesium batteries, and those could have advantages if we can solve these problems. Uh, if you'd like to know more about muon spectroscopy, um, my PhD student and some of my collaborators, um, together we wrote a review article which was published last year. And we also have a lot of online learning materials about muons, which you can find at that web address. Now I know because I study battery materials, I have one view of battery technology and, and how it can be improved, but there's a lot of things that I'm not very familiar with. Um, and they're generally at the larger scales of cells and packs and electrodes. So many of the things that have improved recently in batteries haven't been major changes in the materials. They've been how, in how the cells and the battery packs have been made. So there's a lot of improvements there as well, and those will still continue in coming years. Now, I talked about solid electrolyte batteries as a future, but there's also room for improvement in liquid electrolyte batteries, and they're really important in how the battery works, and they are involved with a lot of these key performance metrics. Now, we already have batteries and predicting how they perform over their lifetime is really important. If you're driving your electric car and you want to know if you're going to get to the nearest charger, you need to know how much energy is stored in it and how much of that energy you're actually going to be get at, able to get out to drive the wheels to the charger. And that understanding is sometimes quite hard to get. But you're also going to wonder how long will the battery in my car last and being able to monitor different things about those cells and the materials inside them is gonna to continue to be important. And if you're a industrial uh, supplier of batteries, you're going to want to know how long you can warranty your battery cells. So you need this information. And one of the things the Faraday Institution projects are looking at is how to link the information we get from experiments that are done outside the cells in their application to the information you can get from cells as they're operated. So you can use one piece of information to infer some other things and then get more understanding and give more useful information to the end user and, and the people uh, perhaps giving maintenance support to them. And the final thing I want to say is that recycling batteries is probably the most critical thing to develop in the long term because we know we're making batteries out of materials that are relatively scarce. Some of them are quite difficult or expensive to mine. And while batteries have lasted longer in electric vehicles than they were predicted to, and they'll have second lives, perhaps doing stationary energy storage and other things, and those, that lifetime is much longer than had originally been expected, they are still going to get to the end of their lives. There'll be battery waste from manufacturing because even if you're producing battery cells in enormous numbers, a tiny fraction not being made correctly still produces a lot of battery waste. So it'll be very important to recycle those as well. And developing those technologies, designing the batteries in the first place to make them easy to recycle, these are gonna be really important questions to address in the next few years. So on that note, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today and um, I'd welcome any questions.